The idea of creation, God creating everything, or the theory of evolution. Which one's a little bit more far-fetched? Stick around. And it's really simple because if you start with the wrong perspective, you'll make the wrong choice. I'm not out to hurt anyone's feelings, but between politically correct or correct, I'll choose the last. Hello and welcome to the Chris F. Walker podcast. I am Chris F. Walker, and I want to thank you again for joining me here today. It's so good to see you and to be with you. I'm grateful for the time that we get to spend together. And today is going to be a fun conversation. I get to have this one quite a bit. And one of my favorite things to talk about when we address this topic is the fact that if we're going to understand where we place our faith on any argument, we always need to understand both sides of the argument. So what we're talking about today is a very, very, um, uh, this is another kind of apologetic uh, kind of uh, topic. And what we're talking about is the theory of evolution or the Big Bang Theory. Uh, and in conjunction with how do we attest to when we compare that with, say, the creation story as found in the book of Genesis in the Bible. And it's a lot of fun to dive into these because what's really interesting for me is that before we even have arguments on this kind of a topic, it's very unique how most people not only come at it with a bias, but in reality, they'll take certain things as just fact, when in reality, there's never been proven evidence one way or the other for certain things. And so I want to address a little bit of what that means. What I mean by this is that your faith, your faith entirely is going to be placed in something that you believe in. That's why it's your belief. And what you decide in your mind makes sense is going to be what ends up kind of deriving a lot of your decisions from that point moving forward. And so when we talk about the idea of creation versus the idea of evolution, it's interesting where a lot of the sociological and even, uh, even some of the economical conversations that we have in our society today really derive around the fact that sometimes people don't necessarily understand where they're really coming from before they start trying to generate a way forward. Uh, so an example would be if you're trying to get from point A to point B, if you know where point B is, that's only half the fight. Because if you think you're at point A and you find out you're actually at point D when you started, and you start heading off towards B, you're going to be heading in the wrong direction because B hasn't changed and we know where that one is. And that's some of the things that we talk about when we say, where are we heading in the future? And I don't mean that we know our future. What I mean is when we're trying to set goals, when we're trying to achieve certain things, we try to do so from the context of we know what that looks like. We kind of have to work our way backwards, not necessarily to where we are, but where we started. Because where we are might already be skewed just a little bit. Um, for example, let's say I set off from England and I'm heading towards America and I'm going in the direction I think is correct, but I find out a little bit later I've actually been heading north the whole time. And in the process of doing that, I now say, oh, well, I've got a course correct. And I know that if I start where I am right now and then head back and that's, and I know that I was supposed to go, you know, to the, to the west, then what you're going to find is you, if you didn't correct for where you had started from in the first place, you're still going to end up missing the target because you used the same directions you should have probably been on from the beginning, but now you're in a different start point. And many of the philosophical debates that are taking place today usually come from the fact that they might have been heading from a certain direction for a certain amount of time. And now as they start trying to go and say, okay, well, it should be working and it's not, Maybe it's because they've, they've gone so far off course that they forgot they need to go back to where it began and then start making the corrections from there. And sometimes it makes, it takes a lot of work to do that. So, but that's kind of the, the analogy of where I'm going with why would we even argue about the origin of the universe? Big Bang Theory versus creation. You would think, honestly, as we move forward, it doesn't really matter, right? Everyone who's, who's there way back at the beginning, they're all dead and gone. Uh, every animal that was here at that time is dead and gone. And most, most of the uh, archaeological 
you know, sites that we can have that look back into a human history don't really go further than maybe say five or 6,000 years as far as human history goes. So then we start saying, okay, well, let's rely on things like how does, uh, how do we get millions of years old dinosaurs if God created the earth and then mankind, which has all probably only been around for maybe 6,000 years or so, uh, if mankind's only been around for that amount of time, then how is it that dinosaurs, which have been around for millions and millions of years, wound up even, you know, playing into the mix and where do animals come from and everything else? And that's what the theory of evolution was really trying to talk about was how do we get from all the way back then to all the way up here? And in the creation story, what was was uh, in six days, everything was just made. And God said, this is how I want it to be. And he made it. So... In the context of this story, we're going to address two different sides of the argument, and I'm going to do my best to try and argue both sides here. And of course, I, I promise you, I'm, I'm not a, uh, a scientist. I don't have, I'm not, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm simply pointing out these are some of the simple arguments uh, that need to be addressed as we decide where we place our faith. Okay, so that's what we're going to dive into as soon as we come back. Stick around, you're going to love it. Please don't forget to follow and review the show today. Also, head over and register at the chrisfwalker.com website. There you'll find links to the Indiegogo and Patreon campaigns, which help keep this show going. You'll also find links to the bookstore, gear shop, blog, and you'll stay up to date on upcoming events and live appearances. Now, let's get back to today's message. Oh, and welcome back. Okay, evolution versus creation. Interesting concept. But what does it really mean to us? And we're going to get into that here in just a second. What I want to do first is I want to actually dive into some of these, these theories. And I'm, I'm, I understand I'm scratching the surface. I, I'm, I'm talking surface level. I know there's roots that go deeper. But my point is, even at the surface, we'll be able to see some of the most fundamental issues with, I guess, either one of them in order to decide whether or not we should believe one way or the other. Okay, let's start with uh, the Bible, creation. Now, according to the creation story, and I'm not talking about, I'm not reading it out of Genesis, I'm simply saying, summed up version, big scale, okay? In the beginning, there was a being who was capable of creating everything. Not just something, everything, okay? And I am going to go ahead and quote some scripture real quick because I want to address this one key element. And you'll see this. This is an argument that's used across the board because a lot of apologetic uh, arguments revolve around the understanding of this key element here. And that is that Genesis 1 begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And a little bit later, there's another phrase that says, and God said, let there be light. And I want to address these elements. Because what we're going to find as we look into the creation story is that there's actually some legitimacy to scientific just has to be's in order for this to have occurred. Now, in order for something to exist, a couple of things need to take place. One, we have to be able to see that there's a result of it. Uh, for example, us. We're here. And we're self-conscious. We actually know we're here. Okay? And so because we're self-conscious, that means we can also be uh, conscious of the things around us. So we know that there is an earth. We know that there are things and and we know that there's such a thing as time and we know that energy exists. So what we need in order for something to exist is you have to have certain elements in place. And those are time, space, matter, and energy. Okay? So with time, space, matter, and energy, the concept of whether or not creation can actually answer that is very vital. Because if we think about it, if there's time and space, but there's no matter, what is it? And if there's space and, and, and matter, but there's no time, when is it? You see, you see where I'm going with this? You have to have all three of those just for existence to exist. And then energy uh, comes in later when we talk about life. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to get to that in just a sec. So time, space, matter. In the beginning time. God created the heavens, space, and the earth. Matter. So actually in Genesis 1-1, it actually accommodates for time, space, and matter. Now then when God said, let there be light, 
That is the first form of energy. All energy that we know of on this planet all kicks off from a, a light source uh, that's just a few million miles away, but it's a really big ball that burns all the time, and the sun is the source of energy on our planet. And that light, and again, I'm not I understand that God actually creates light before he creates the sun. And that's something that a lot of people have a hard time with, and that's in the Genesis story. I understand. Again, surface level here. We're staying just at the argument level. So the concept of energy means that we need to have life to consume and produce energy. And energy needs to start from somewhere, and God said, let there be light. So in the creation story, time, space, matter, and energy, all four are actually accounted for in the Genesis uh, account. Now, bring this back home to a little bit more of a practical, uh, you know, worldview here. What we're really saying is that there's a creature of some kind, a being that is outside the realms of time, space, matter, and energy because he's able to create time, space, matter, and energy and that he wanted to do everything that we see around us on purpose. And for a lot of us, when we look at some of the chaos of our world, we then turn around and we say, well, I don't know if that makes sense because if it were me, I wouldn't have made it that way. Well, and that's the reality there is you're not, you're not the one who created it. You can look at it and you can perceive it, but it's not yours. And at the same time, when we say things like a chaotic world, we have to understand how much chaos is really in this world. There's 24 hours in a day. There's seven days in a week. Those things, the, all those constants are there. We know that they exist. And because they're constant, we can start doing other things within them. Gravity works. It's going to, it continues to work. It will. That's what gravity does. Um, light itself. Light is light. It's not, there is no dark. There is merely the absence of light. And light is, is essential. And these things are things that are absolute. And as we, as we look around and we determine these kinds of absolutes, we, we start deciding whether or not it's so chaotic after all. Think about this one. DNA is made up of not just a code, but a code that can adapt and change in almost four dimensions. Because it's not just a matter of what it can do in terms of height, width, uh, you know, all those things that have to do with the third dimension, but there's also that time element. DNA can actually adjust for over the course of time making changes, which is where some of the theory of evolution really comes into play when they address that is because, yes, people who all have blue eyes who are giving children, who are giving birth to children, eventually you can breed out the, the gene of something that might not be blue eyes. And that's where that kind of stuff comes into play. DNA has that ability over the course of time to still be affected. But what that doesn't account for, if we're talking in the terms of the creation uh, theory, is when we say things, okay, well, if that's the case, if creation is true, how do we explain the millions of years concept? And in reality, that's where you have some of the contestation. Not everyone buys into the millions of years. And there are people who believe that the earth is in fact as, as young as maybe 6,000, 7,000 years old. Now, why would they think that when we have things like uh, carbon dating. Well, if you actually understand that carbon dating is even at its finest point, something that is more of a guesstimate. And then you start looking into things like some, there was a recent dis uh, discovery where they actually discovered a dinosaur bone that still had proteins inside of the marrow of the bone. And if that thing's millions of years, that's a simple impossibility. It's impossible for that to happen. They don't know exactly how that happened yet. And if the earth is in fact thousands of years old, then that's actually a possibility. But if it's millions, it's just not capable. On that same note, there's things like the stars and the comets, and, and we have all these kinds of different types of asteroids that are out there. There's all these different arguments. Okay, so we have asteroids that are short-term and long-term, but if it's millions and millions of years, most of those asteroids would be gone, as well as the long-term ones. They're not even there because it's millions of years old. Uh, and when we see the swirls of things like the Milky Way, and there's these lines and arms in how the stars and constellations are being formed, uh, if it's millions of years old by simple uh, centrifugal force and, and, and gravity, uh, eventually that stuff's going to kind of mold itself out and just turn into kind of a smear instead of these defined arms. But if you're thousands of years old, that's still a possibility. Millions of years, that's actually a little bit hard. So there's arguments against millions of years, but there's arguments for. Otherwise, we wouldn't have that theory in the first place. But I do want to point out that in the context of us, before we dive into evolution, I want to point out Charles Darwin, who was the author of the book of the theory of evolution, 
what he really said in the process of writing this work was he said, in order to free the sciences from the Bible. So what he did was he said in the beginning stages of his book that his purpose of writing the book was to find an alternate viewpoint other than that found in the Bible. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's wrong or right. It just means, understand, that was, his, that was the point of his argument when he made it. And he made it well enough that a lot of people jumped on board with it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today having these kinds of arguments. So, the idea of creation, does it account for time, space, matter, and energy? Yes. And then, in terms of, is it feasible? Well, if it were feasible, then we still have to just look at it from a grand scheme. Would we be here to see it? If the idea that it happened occurred, what would we, what would be the byproduct would be us. We're here. We can see stuff. There's, there's stuff. So as improbable as it might seem, it's at least a possibility. Okay. So let's jump in a little bit more, uh, on the other side now. Let's talk about the theory of evolution. So in the theory of evolution, the idea is that in the beginning, there were some types of naturally occurring acids that were formed after the Big Bang and everything cooled down and everything compressed together and we have stars and we have planets. Uh, and there's a whole lot of not much um, explanation within this. So the context of that is that one, time has always been. Time is something that is absolute in that context because at the beginning of it, uh, it was already there because no one created it, it just is. And then matter is another one where they have a hard time because in the beginning there's a whole lot of nothing and then it just explodes into literally everything. And it's, it is, there's some questions in there because nothing is, has a very difficult time to create something. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong because again, we don't know. No one was there. Just like no one was there at the beginning to actually account for whether creation was true, no one was there at the beginning to actually account whether or not the Big Bang happened the way that the theory of evolution kind of talks about it when they combine those two together. So the idea of evolution itself, though, is that as the naturally occurring substances formed together, they then were able to create a single-celled life form, which as it continued to grow, was able to reproduce and complex itself. It was able to start becoming a multi-celled life form. And then eventually it started actually generating, uh, you know, body parts and it started being able to uh, accommodate for things that would help it to grow into new ways within the environment. And as time progresses, all forms of life on the planet actually derive from this first uh, chemical creation. Okay, and so let's let's stop with this one real quick, and let's go back and address some of the, the some of the hard points of that. One, if it's a naturally occurring substance that was able to combine to create life once over the course of billions of years, why did the naturally occurring substance never create life again? And why is it in the concepts of, you know, chemistry and scientific research, have we never been able to identify what these naturally occurring substances are, which there's not that many of them, and which combination it was of those that actually combined together to create an actual life form. And they haven't really been able to accommodate to solve that particular element. Okay, and then on the next note is, if the first form of life was capable of sustaining itself within its environment, and remember, there's no other forms of life around yet, then it becomes a big question of how exactly did the evolution occur? Because the idea of evolution is that things would evolve based on their environment into higher forms of life that would sustain themselves even better. Okay, so, so the first form of life is a life form, but in order for life to exist, it still has to have energy. Now, life today makes energy one of two ways. If it's an animal, it consumes energy from other forms of life. And two, if it's a plant, it creates starches to feed itself the energy it needs. And for that, it uses photosynthesis, which requires the sunlight, the water. And there's another key element that's required, and that is it requires carbon dioxide. Now, in the millions of years process, if this first form of life uh, that was a plant was taking in the carbon dioxide, but then expelling the byproduct, which is oxygen, but there's no animals around, what was it that turned the oxygen back into carbon dioxide? Because that's what animals do. You see, that life cycle element is what the theory of evolution has a hard time actually accounting for the further back we go. 
And on that same note, we then have to ask if the theory of evolution, meaning it evolves, means that this first form of life did not require food or sustenance or water or carbon dioxide or oxygen or any of that in order to survive, why would it evolve into things that now require these things or it would die? That's kind of counterproductive to the idea of getting better at your environment. So the idea that things have grown and become better is not a far-fetched idea. We see that. We actually can see it in, in, our, in our nature. We can see it in, in, a, in, the, in a lot of different uh, fossil style, you know, archaeological finds is that there's, there's evidence to say that things were slowly changing. But as it's slowly changing, the thing that we've never found is the key element that most people who are against the theory of evolution really kind of hone in on. And that is there is no place where a plant becomes an animal or vice versa that we've ever seen. But that doesn't account for things like how do we account for the Neanderthals and how do we, how do we account for, uh, things like dinosaurs? And those were, that's where the creation story people always have to kind of revolve back to the Bible and start talking about different stories for, you know, how do we find, um, prehistoric ocean dwelling fossils on the top of the Himalayas? Well, because according to the Bible, that used to be underwater when the flood happened and then the mountains rose. And that's the answer that would pose that would pose a, a, an answer to that question. But again, that's something we've never seen for the other side of this argument here for an evolutionist. There's again, never been any proof or evidence of this massive uh, kind of uh, flood, not on the scale that is being talked about in the Bible. But at the same time, again, the people who are in favor of it, they argue back and forth. So you see where this goes is what it ultimately comes down to. What it ultimately comes down to is, do you believe one way or the other based off of your own view of how things work? And we only have what's around us to view off of what it is. No one was there to originally witness the beginning. Not in human scale anyway. There was no human being around. Even in the creation story, the last thing made was humanity. We didn't witness that. We didn't witness how God made it. So the idea of how does the earth become earth is something that's a measure of faith. Whether you believe one way or the other, it is something you take on faith. Now, here's where I want to go with that. If we believe that we came from someone who has a very real desire to be with us who holds us valuable, who has a purpose and a design for why we were built, then as we live our life today, the question is, what are the motivations that are going to derive some of our decision-making processes? And well, again, if I'm valued and if I'm treasured and if I'm built on purpose, well, then I should live my life as though I'm valued and treasured and I, and I, and I have a purpose. But if I'm just a random you know, occurring event, then one of two phrases tends to come around. And that is, one is, uh, when you die, you're just gone, so do whatever you can now and just enjoy it. Or, uh, and then what that really comes down to a lot of times is that means that take what you can, even if it hurts other people. And that can come across that way. Uh, and then the other side of it, though, is that if I know that this is the only short period of time I have, then I want to make as much of an impact as I can, there's still a nobility to that. And so it's not necessarily whether you believe in creation or if you believe in evolution and the Big Bang Theory that's going to derive whether or not you make choices that are going to be ideal or have a, have a lasting legacy. What it really derives for is how do you view your worth and what is it you plan to accomplish while you're here? Because if while you're here all you want is selfish gain, it doesn't matter what you believe in you're going to choose things that are going to be selfish and it's going to hurt people because you can't get everything you want without at some point or another trying to take it from someone else. And if we then turn around and we say, but if I'm here for a good time and I want to, or I'm here for a, a purpose and I want to try and make sure that it's noble, then you can still live a very good moral life regardless of what argument you put your, your faith behind. What it really comes down to when we believe in creation versus evolution is do you believe or not that there is a creator. 
And that becomes the root cause of, of all these arguments. If there's no creator, we're honestly left to our own devices and humanity has proven that we're not always very good. But if there is a creator, then maybe we should really seek out what it is he had in mind from the beginning so that we can really dive into what that'll mean for our life and how we should live it. I realize your time is the most precious commodity you could possibly share with anyone. So I want to thank you again for spending some of yours here with me today. Don't forget to review the message for others. And be sure to follow the Chris F. Walker podcast for new releases. Remember, your generous support on sites like Indiegogo and Patreon are making this show possible. Don't forget to register at the ChrisFWalker.com website for links to the bookstore, gear shop, and to stay updated for new events and appearances. I hope to see you again soon. God bless.